As Russian troops roll their tanks to eastern Ukraine, Ukraine's foreign minister says in just days that area will resemble the front lines of World War II. Retired Four Star General, former CIA Director David Petraeus is here to help us understand this all. So, as General, thanks for joining us. A top Ukrainian military official said the Russians are making final preparations for what he called a massive breakthrough in eastern Ukraine. It seems, what, from what we understand, from what General Milley said, this land is more open, less wooded, which I guess would undermine the successful Ukrainian tactics for the Battle of Kiev, uh, Kiev which, was, which were more guerrilla in tactics. W what are you expecting next in the region? Well, it's going to be quite a fight. Uh, but, Jake, let's review what happened uh, over, really, the course of this very quickly. Um, what we've seen, uh, initially, the main effort was Kyiv. And so you saw the column that came down from there and another one that came over here. There were also cities up here, Chernihiv and Sumy. Uh, and essentially, the Ukrainians stopped them cold and then started to counterattack, and then the Russians withdrew all these forces like that. So that campaign is over. Uh, the Ukrainians won the battles of Kyiv, Chernihiv, and Sumy. They were also trying to get to Odessa. That's the major port on the Black Sea. They got stopped cold right at Mykolaiv, and now the Ukrainians are counterattacking down there. So the focus now is the Donbass, uh, and that is this area here. This is what was controlled originally by the separatists right here. Um, you still have the Battle of Mariupol going on. There are still three areas in which there is resistance that the Russians have to deal with. But once they deal with that, you'll see these forces come like this, and then you'll see the ones that are being pushed in to the east of Kharkiv and coming down here, uh, these little salients that you can see. Because what they want to do is to encircle, if they can, the Ukrainian forces that have been fighting along essentially the front lines of the Donbass, which is almost a World War I kind of situation with trenches. I've been there. I was there several years ago. And you're right. This is much more open. Uh, although there are some cities, and they are generally uh, road hubs as well. And by the way, this is Kramatorsk. This is where that terrible uh, bombing of the train station took place that you discussed earlier. Yeah. So that's what's coming. Now, and we saw this convoy. This has been laid out for everyone. Uh, again, satellites picked this up. They're moving south. Uh, so to come back to Donbass, what they're doing is they're, they're over here moving along like this, and they're coming south, and again, they're going to be pushed in from here. And of course, you have a new commander. Uh -huh. uh, you have General Dvornikov. He is known as the butcher of Syria for yeah, this me... brutal campaign that he prosecuted in Syria when he was the commander there in 2016. And what does it tell you that, uh, that Putin put General Alexander Dvornikov in charge of the invasion now? Not just, obviously, that, that the previous military uh, efforts failed, but does this mean that it's going to get even worse, even more brutal, even more uh, targeting of civilians? I fear that it may. Uh, again, the Russians were known in Syria basically for, quote, depopulating areas. That's what they did to Aleppo. That's what they did to other areas. Uh, and I think we can expect that. We saw, you know, the very first operation taken under him includes that terrible strike uh, on the rail station. So you're going to see the focus again. The focus is the southeast. Uh, they have said, you know, phase one is over, achieved all our objectives, which actually they withdrew from, again, the main effort originally, which was Kyiv. They didn't topple the government, replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure. So now they're putting it all into the southeast. And what they'd like to do, of course, is by 9 May, they'd like to have a success so that when they celebrate World War II Victory Day, they can also say that they have now denazified the southeast part of Ukraine. That's all they really wanted to do all along. And again, they'd love to have an area that would be all of this right here, plus this ground link uh, to Crimea. Uh, and he could paint that as a, as a success. President Putin could. And again, you have this one general that will be in charge of all of this. So the first time you actually have one figure who is the overall commander. Now, he's been involved here, but now everyone else is stepping aside. He's in charge. And again, I think you can, you can expect more of what we have seen. The hallmark of the Russian forces so far has been indiscipline, not discipline. It has been violation uh, of the Geneva Convention and the land, law of land warfare and so forth. We've seen repeated uh -huh. evidence of that. And that's what we're going to see more of, I fear, yeah. in the days and weeks that lie ahead. So we've got to do everything we can to provide everything yeah. as quickly as possible. General David Petraeus, thank you so much for helping us understand that better. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jake. Some in the West are proposing that Ukraine concede 
the Donbass, the Eastern Territory to Russia, so as to bring it into the bloodshed, to bring it into the war. But those experts may have lost sight of one key part of, of what motivates Ukrainians. They know what and who they're fighting against. They know life under Russian repression. I want to warn you, some of the images we're about to bring you are graphic and disturbing. Only 25 years ago, here in Lviv, Ukraine, this statue, cast in bronze, was erected. A Ukrainian breaking free of Russian bondage. The inscription, to the victims of communist crimes. The statue was built under the initiative of a former Soviet prisoner. And there are other such survivors still alive, still sharing their stories. Uh, but, but they were that small? A little, uh, a little bit bigger. Miroslav Marinovich is vice rector of Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and a former prisoner in a Soviet gulag in the Ural Mountains. We met up with him at Ukraine's National Museum and Memorial of Victims of Occupation Regimes, which highlights Polish, Nazi, and Soviet oppression. This is the place where the tragedy is concentrated. It's a very painful place. Tiny cement cells and tools of deliberate discomfort, even torture by the Soviets, used against critics and human rights activists, such as Marinovich, who was held in a similar place. I was with one other a prisoner. In the 1970s, he and other activists dared to document and publish Soviets' humanitarian violations in Ukraine. Similar to what Putin is trying to prevent news and human rights organizations from doing today. We were arrested, punished with maximum terms uh, as most dangerous state criminals. This is just because you detailed human rights abuses and wrote about it. That was your crime? Yes. Yes, it was the only crime of mine. And of course, the Soviet Union questioned everything we wrote. It denied any violations, and we were treated as liars, uh, and for that punished. Seven years of hard labor, followed by three more in exile in a small town in Kazakhstan, for telling the truth about the brutality of the Kremlin. Mass killings. Uh, mass torturing, awful information uh, war against lo local po population. Now we see the same technique in the eastern of Ukraine. If Putin prevails, then the whole Ukraine will be uh, intimidated with awful uh, terror. So I'm, I'm very afraid of that. Faulkner once said the past is never dead, it's not even past. The people of Ukraine, they don't have to imagine what life would be like under Russian rule, the oppression, the cruelty. They've already lived it. The cells that held dissidents and human rights activists, those cells are still here. Since 2005, Russia officially is the heir of the Soviet Union and views themselves as a continuation of the Soviet Union. The museum's historian, who curates cruelty for a living, has this warning for the world. We know from Ukrainian history about three genocides against the Ukrainian people, and history is repeating once again. Do you think the fact that Ukrainians like yourself have been through this, have survived it, have been strong enough to get here, uh, gives you, does that give you any hope that you'll be able to get through this? Uh, I'm absolutely sure that Ukraine will win uh, this war because we understand the danger that may happen with us uh, if Putin uh, wins. Marinovich warns he hears echoes, not only of Stalin in what Putin says, but of past world leaders who tried to appease Stalin in the words of those who seek today to appease Putin. He was victorious, so the world decided, okay, for security reason, we would better preserve peace. But for us, it was like leaving seeds in the ground. And now we see that these seeds 
uh, are blossoming again. Seeds of crimes, seeds of communist uh, ideology, communist uh, visions. That's why my appeal now to the world is, please do not commit the same mistake in order to preserve security to leave these Putin's seeds in ground again.